All right. Can you hear me? Thank you for coming out tonight to the Whalen Library. We are excited to have Professor Matt Liebman here for our second great presenter's presentation of 2024. Uh, professor Liebman is a Peabody Professor of American Archaeology and Ethnology and Chair of the Department of Anthropology at Harvard. An archaeologist who works mainly in the Southwest, he received his BA from BC and his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of Revolt, an Archaeological History of Pueblo Resistance and Re Revitalization in 17th Century New Mexico, and editor of Enduring Conquest, Rethinking the Archaeology of Resistance to Spanish Colonialism, as well as Archaeology and the Postcolonial Critique. His research focuses on indigenous colonial interactions with New Mexico, where he conducted research in collaboration with the Pueblo of Jemez since 2001. He's lived in Whalen since 2018. Just a couple housekeeping notes. We are recording this, so it will be available on Waycam and also the library's YouTube page. Um, and tonight, um, I want to acknowledge the following indigenous peoples on whose traditional lands we live, work, and gather today. The Massachusetts, the Nipmuc, the Wampanoag, and the Pawtucket. And we seek to understand, acknowledge, and remember the painful ongoing history of war, genocide, and forced removal of indigenous peoples by European settlers. And we offer a living celebration of the commu indigenous communities who continue to live and make history here today. Professor Lehman will speak for about 45 minutes. Please hold your questions till the end. If you're joining us on Zoom, put your question in the chat at any time, and I will read it out loud when we get there. And now I'll get out of the way. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to all of you for um, coming out tonight um, and for supporting the Wayland Public Library, uh, <laughs> which we should all do. Um, I live <laughs> right up the road. I could walk home almost from here. Um, and as you heard, uh, I've been a Wayland resident for about six years now, and we love Wayland. Um, so um, I'm going to talk tonight. I have this kind of semi-provocative new title I'm trying out called Proto-American History. And by Proto-American, I'm referring here to the earliest origins of what becomes America. Um, and I think that'll become a little more clear as I get into the, to the talk. So I'm an archaeologist, as you heard. I work in a department of anthropology. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in the history that kind of lurks behind our standard histories of, uh, uh, of America. Um, so I work in the colonial period. It's what we call current events in uh, archaeology. I work in the 17th century mostly. Uh, but in this talk today, I'm going to go back um, about uh, a thousand years. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for us. When does American history begin? This is kind of a trick question, because of course it depends on how we define history and how we define American. Um, as an archaeologist, I'm using uh, history with a lowercase h to refer to the events of the past and not exclusively to the written record, uh, which is how uh, most traditional histories uh, are built. Um, and uh, as far as American, I'll get into that um, a little later in the talk. So most people would think there's some obvious dates when we think about American history. Right? And a lot of people would start in 1776, maybe, with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That would, I guess, more correctly, that would be if we're defining American as the United States, uh, as many colloquially uh, do. Around here, we could easily go back to 1620 uh, with the landing at, at Plymouth. Um, uh, or, of course, we could go all the way back to 1492. Uh, with the arrival of uh, Columbus in the Americas, but I'm going to be a little provocative tonight and suggest that actually there's an earlier date that we could go to to trace the very beginnings of the American project. And the one that I would suggest is about a thousand years ago, 1021. And there's a very specific reason that I'm starting at 1021, which I'll get to in a minute, but first I want us to think about what's going on in America 1,000 years ago. And there's actually a lot going on. This is kind of 
the classic period in America, the heyday of America. If we go out to New Mexico, uh, where I do my research, there's a place called Chaco Canyon. Um, and what we see a thousand years ago at Chaco Canyon is really the apogee of indigenous architecture in the Americas. So the ancestral Pueblo people, sometimes referred to as the Anasazi, are building structures out there that have hundreds of rooms, as you can see here, um, up to five stories tall. Um, there's a whole cluster of these. Here's a reconstruction of what this is one of the largest of these called Pueblo Benito at the center of Chaco Canyon would have looked like uh, in its heyday. Um, and this is a pilgrimage center drawing in tens of thousands of people from all over the Southwest. Um, and so here's another an unexcavated uh, site um, in, also in Chaco Canyon. And you can see very faintly here, I wish, there's, is there, can we get the light off of here? Um, very faintly, there are ancient roads that you can, ah, that's perfect, uh, ancient roads that you can see um, going off in the distance here. And so they built razor straight roads over hundreds of miles that united tens of thousands of people in the Southwest. And we know from archeology span that they are conducting long distance trade with people more than 2,000 miles away uh, down in Mexico. So if your picture of 1,000 years ago in America is, you know, uh, people running around uh, hunting buffalo. It, uh, it's much more complex um, than, than that. At the exact same time that things are happening in Chaco Canyon, if we go outside of modern day St. Louis, Missouri, uh, there is uh, the uh, earliest urban experiments in America at a place that we call Cahokia. And so this is the closest thing we have to uh, what we'd call true urban life in ancient America. Um, this was a city uh, that in 1021 was as large as London at the time. Uh, there were probably about um, 20,000 people that lived at the city center proper, which is uh, uh, the core of which you're seeing um, pictured here, and probably about 40,000 in the, in the immediate surrounding uh, hinterlands. Um, at the center of Cahokia is the third largest pyramid in the New World. Um, it's called Monk's Mound, uh, and most people don't recognize that we had uh, pyramids here in uh, North America, probably because this one's built out of dirt. I always say, if this was made out of stone, it would be as famous as the pyramids in Mexico, and uh, the, if you, any of you have been to Guatemala to see, uh, or, or the Yucatan to see uh, Maya pyramids, this would be just as famous. But they didn't have stone in this area. So they built this pyramid using basket loads of dirt. Um, uh, they piled up uh, enough, it, it today is about 10 stories tall. Um, the base covers 16 acres, so here's a reconstruction of what it might have looked like. That's three acres more than the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, would have taken 21 million cubic feet of earth. This, there was no natural hill here. This was entirely built um, by humans. So this is just a point and kind of a digression about the main point of my talk, but just to say that a thousand years ago, America, there were a lot of things uh, that were going on. It was an extraordinarily dynamic um, place. Um, but I'm gonna focus on this third site all the way up in Newfoundland that maybe some of you have heard about called Lansaw Meadows. Um, and this is the reason that I really chose 1021 as our start date, because uh, this is a place um, where we have the first uh, concrete evidence for European contact in the Americas. Um, it is a Norse site, so uh, basically Vikings. You're not supposed to say Vikings, but they were <laughs> pretty much Vikings. Uh, established a colony uh, in 1021 um, all the way up there in Newfoundland. It was excavated in the 1960s um, by a uh, uh, Norwegian excavation team, Helga and Einestine uh, Ingstad. Um, and uh, they found, among other things, hundreds of 11th century North Norse artifacts, um, including this bronze ring-headed pin, which was kind of the smoking gun. And they found this. It was definitive evidence that um, uh, Europeans uh, were here because nobody in the New World was using um, bronze technology at that time. And they also found wooden ship pieces, um, as well as ironstone and bone items. But the wood is particularly important 
because um, about three years ago, they were able to use dendrochronology, tree ring dating, on the wood to establish that a bunch of the wood showed that it had been cut in 1021. And so that's what gave us that year as a year that this site was occupied. Now, incidentally, they also found their butternuts and butternut wood, which is what I'm showing the picture of here. That's interesting because butternut trees did not grow in Newfoundland in a, th a thousand years ago, nor do they grow there today. But they do grow in northern Maine. So this is possible evidence that they were actually moving up and down the coast. It could have been traded north, but um, I think most people suspect that uh, that place, uh, Lansaw Meadows, was kind of a, a way station that they were using, um, and they were probably exploring up and down uh, the east coast here. Um, so this is our earliest evidence for European colonization of the Americas, um, and this is how I'm choosing to define America today. Right? I'm, I'm not talking about the landmass that some people would call Turtle Island. Um, I'm starting America with the idea that the American project begins to emerge when Europeans begin to colonize North America, followed um, a, a little while later by um, uh, Asians and, and Africans coming to the Western Hemisphere. Um, and the question I'm really trying to get at with this provocative start date is, was the outcome of European contact in the Americas, basically where we are today, was this all inevitable? Or could things have happened differently? Now, I'm going to return to this site at the end, and hopefully uh, that will give me a nice place to land the plane here. We'll see if I can, I can pull this off. But now I'm going to jump 500 years ahead to the traditional date that most of us think about when we think of the colonization of the Americas, 1492, Columbus of course, sails the ocean blue uh, in the Nina the Pinta. Now, um, here archaeology has a role to play too. Archaeologists have actually located the site of uh, Columbus's um, first two colonies. He, he first, uh, actually, he, he runs the Santa Maria aground on a reef on um, Christmas Eve. Uh, and so he leaves the people, the crew of the Santa Maria behind, and they create a fort called um, Navidad. That doesn't go well. Everybody's dead when he comes back the, the next year. It's kind of a sad note. Archaeologists have found that site as well. But um, the main uh, colony that Columbus establishes is called La Isabella. It's in modern-day um, Dominican Republic, excavated by um, Kathy Deegan, who you see pictured here. Um, and I just think it's pretty cool. They actually found Columbus's house. So if you go there today, you can stand in Columbus's house and look out on the ocean as Columbus would have uh, in uh, 1494. Um, now, um, from there, of course, Spaniards and then other Euro and Italians and other Europeans fan out across the New World and come into contact with indigenous peoples uh, everywhere they go. And as probably many of you are familiar, quite often that has disastrous effects uh, for the indigenous peoples, including the decimation of indigenous populations. Um, but I'm going to take a half step back here and pause to ask a basic question, and that is, how many people lived in the Americas in 1492? Now, this is an issue that has been debated for more than a century by historians, archaeologists, um, demographers, scholars of Native American studies. Um, and uh, this debate is truly remarkable because everybody looks at relatively the same body of data and comes up with wildly different answers to that question of how many people lived here. So on the low end of the spectrum, conservative estimates speculate that around only around 8 million people would have lived in the Western Hemisphere in 1492. And, uh, Later, I can explain how they're coming up with these numbers. But these numbers are in contrast with those who speculate populations larger by uh, more than an order of magnitude, um, most famously a demographer named Henry Dobbins, who estimated that 112 million people were living in the Americas in 1492. And if Dobbins is accurate, more people would have been living in the Americas, that's North and South America combined, um, than in Europe at that time. Now, these 
what we call maximalist estimates are based on the notion that waves of um, epidemic disease sweep up from central Mexico uh, and run throughout the Americas shortly after Cortez's conquest uh, of the Aztecs. And so, in fact, often when we're getting first contact uh, stories from Europeans in North America, Dobbin's theory is this is a landscape that has already been um, decimated by, uh, by depopulation, by um, smallpox, typhus, all the diseases uh, that we usually hear about. Not everybody accepts that argument, as, as we'll see in a second. Um, but we can ask ourselves, why does it matter? Seven million, eight million, 112 million, you know, this is 500 years ago, and, and does it really make a difference? But I would argue that it, it really does make a significant difference um, because it really radically changes our understanding of global history. If Dobbin's 112 million estimate is correct, then um, one in every five people on the earth would have died in the 17th century as a result of uh, the diseases introduced in uh, the New World. And this would have been the greatest destruction of human life in world history. And of course, from the Native American perspective, um, we might ask uh, you know, whether this could be correctly called a genocide or not. Now, I'm not going to actually try to resolve that debate here, but the, the, the origin of this question becomes how intentional was the depopulation that took place, how much of it was uh, an accident of biology um, and geography and, and genes. Um, now, historians uh, have questioned the utility of even asking these questions, right? And so there's this famous 1988 book in which a historian named David Hennig declares all these estimates to be forlorn attempts to answer a thoroughly unanswerable question. Um, you know, his argument is basically that the early writings that give us any population history by Europeans are inaccurate, they're not worth the paper that they're written on, and we will never know uh, what the population really was. Um, and um, I took that as kind of a challenge uh, because as an archaeologist, um, trying to get at what really happened that's not written down is what we do. That's really my, my job here. Um, uh, but uh, Hennig also notes that reconstructing population estimates um, based on archaeological data is incredibly difficult, as uh, you might imagine. Um, so uh, in many, many places, uh, the material culture, the, the architecture that people are living in, is made of perishable materials. Around here, people are living in witus, um, you know, bark and wooden houses that don't leave much of a signature behind uh, after people move out of them. Same for people living in teepees on the, the plains, highly mobile peoples. It's just really hard to figure out how many people uh, were on the ground at any given time based on uh, material culture that's constantly moving around, rotting away, um, and, and not well preserved. So uh, I was smart enough to, or lucky enough to happen uh, into an area which doesn't have that same problem. Um, I work in New Mexico, uh, which is highlighted in red here. Um, and I set out with my research team to try to figure out how many people lived here before European contact, um, and also what was the tempo and magnitude of indigenous population decline as a result of the encounters between Native Americans and uh, Europeans. So I'm going to show you a little bit of my research um, now. So for those who haven't been to northern New Mexico, uh, it's a fantastic part of the country. So the capital of Santa Fe is right here. Um, Oh, I should use my pointer. Can they see that on the uh, screen? So this is the modern city of Albuquerque between Sandia and Isleta Pueblo. Each of these names here are um, uh, the names of individual Pueblo tribes. Um, so I'm going to use the term Pueblo here to refer both to the people. We call them Pueblo peoples, uh, the most famous probably being the Hopi tribes in northern Arizona that don't appear on this map because they're right, right off <coughs> the edge over here and the Zuni Pueblos, um, but a Pueblo, uh, the, the term Pueblo both refers to the people as well as the place. So we call the village that they live in a Pueblo, um, and um, uh, we call these people the different Pueblo tribes. Now, what you're seeing here is um, uh, uh, 19 different tribes uh, that speak six different mutually unintelligible languages, 
still today. So they do not think of themselves as a unitary group. The label Pueblo was given to them by the Spaniards who came in to differentiate them from the nomadic Navajo and Apache peoples who are moving around um, the outside. Um, I work with Hema's Pueblo out here in the west. And if any of you are fans of Breaking Bad, uh, like this is where they go cook the meth out, <laughs> out here. So that's what New Mexico is mainly famous for um, today. Um, <clears throat> Now, the reason this is a great place to research this question about what was the population like and what were the effects of European content is that um, the architecture uh, doesn't move around and it doesn't rot away, right? So they use adobe and masonry architecture that preserves really, really well. So I work on sites that are 500, 600 years old where you can still see the walls uh, of the buildings that people lived in. This is Taos Pueblo for people who have been out there still occupied today. Um, uh, many argue it's uh, the longest occupied um, uh, city village in uh, North America today. Um, now, uh, all the research I'm going to show you here, I conduct in collaboration with the Pueblo of Hamas. They are my uh, research partners. Um, so these are uh, gentlemen who are on a, a council of um, religious leaders there, and I consult with the tribe um, to develop appropriate research questions and methodologies. They participate in the interpretation of the results, um, and um, so uh, we work closely uh, together. There was a time when archaeologists uh, pretty much didn't listen to contemporary indigenous peoples, just did what they wanted, and I very much try not to repeat that paradigm and try to work closely. Um, the um, descendant communities, and that includes um, them gathering data with us in the field. So here is my good friend uh, Aaron Tosa, who actually comes here to Wayland every every year because he he comes and helps me out at Harvard. Uh, he and his wife are traditional potters, so they they make pottery. But here we are at one of the sites. So Aaron's standing on a collapsed room block. So these all would have been rooms. Uh, you know, they're about um, oh eight or nine feet long, eight or nine feet wide, um, if you dug down into this mound. And so you can see it's all stone masonry architecture here, curving around there. And then there's another room block um, that moves out down there. Aaron's collecting um, pottery and other artifacts here um, from the surface. Um, so the landscape, uh, it's a high desert climate, uh, fantastic place to work. And in the Hamas Valley, where, where I work, um, they actually built their villages on tops of these giant mesas. Um, uh, so here's a uh, reconstruction of what one of their villages would look like. They were pretty large, so the, the big ones had around 1,500 to 2,000 people uh, living in them, and there were 18 of them occupied on the eve of European contact. So I'll get to that um, in just a minute. Uh, I love this reconstruction uh, with one exception. So uh, it's unrealistic in that it shows a heavily forested environment um, that's what it looks like today in this forest. But at the time that it was occupied, uh, all those trees would have been cut down because they're using the timber for uh, architecture, for the roof beams in their house, and also to heat themselves. Uh, there's a lot of snow that uh, happens. It gets about three feet deep on tops of the mesas in most uh, winters. Um, so they're, they're using a lot of wood for fuel, for um, cooking as well. And so uh, I'll, I'll tell you before how we can see, but we know that the mesa tops were almost completely denuded um, at that time. Um, now, in 1540, that's when we have the earliest contact, when Spaniards come up from Mexico into what's now um, New Mexico. So their first direct contact with Europeans in this part of the world happens about 20 years after the Pilgrims land down at uh, Plymouth uh, out here. Um, and then uh, permanent colonization happens uh, about 60 years later in 1598. So uh, initially there are a series of what they call entradas. These, this is uh, the Coronado entrada. People who move up, move around, they're looking for gold or whatever they can find. When they don't find it, they go back down uh, to Mexico until 1598 when uh, they come up and establish uh, the colonial capital uh, eventually at Santa Fe. Uh, and uh, there are Franciscan missionaries that come up and establish uh, missions as well. And then settlers start to establish farmsteads, Spanish um, settlers. Um, and so from those various expeditions that come into the Southwest and the early colonial documents, we do have a couple of population estimates. 
Um, the first one comes from 1583, where he estimates that that valley that I work in has 30,000 people in it. Now, I've been working in this valley for over 25 years, and I have no idea how many people live there today. This guy came into the valley for less than 48 hours and declared that 30,000 people uh, live there. Obviously, that's a very round number. It's a very big number. Um, you know, I think everybody has always taken this with a grain of salt, um, but nonetheless, that was our earliest population estimate. Um, but it got a little confusing because in the 1620s, a Franciscan priest tells us there are 6,566 people living there. Um, in the 1630s, we're told there are 3,000 people living there. And our first really secure dates where we can see the archaeology aligning with the Spanish documents are in the 1690s. This is, I, I wrote a book about this period um, when we know pretty definitively that there are less than 900 people on the ground. And so at the start of this project, we look at this data, and there's a lot of different ways you can interpret what's going on here, right? So one would be that there's a huge population initially, and then an early wave of disease that wipes that population uh, mainly out, and then it uh, trickles down. If we're going to uh, you know, take this one with a grain of salt, uh, we could have other kinds of uh, patterns, uh, you know, maybe not early depopulation, and then um, later depopulation. If you ascribe to Dobbins' theory that came up with 112 million estimate, this number would already be lowered. So this would already reflect some major epidemic disease. So it, it potentially in pre-colonial times, before they have any contact, this could be, who knows, uh, 60,000, maybe even, even more, right? And so all this we're trying to get a handle on uh, by looking on the ground what's the evidence left behind for how many people were actually um, there. And that becomes a little bit tricky, but this uh, gives you a sense of what these sites look like. Uh, that picture of my friend Aaron, he was standing right here on the, on the room block. Um, and that's what it looks like today. So we were lucky to use a modern technology called LIDAR. Um, uh, basically, you fly over in an airplane and it shoots lasers at the ground. I know it sounds very high tech. I, I, I only get the data afterwards. I don't do any of the, the fancy stuff. But the advantage of LIDAR is it actually sees through trees. So you can see here, there are these pine trees covering everything. But um, because of the way this technology works, we can actually see the ground even beneath the trees. And so we're able to use that technology to create really accurate maps down to 10 centimeters um, of these sites uh, and uh, using a, a computer program called Geographic Information Systems, we were able to estimate the floor area of the architecture that was left behind without having to dig at all. We didn't have to turn over one spade of dirt. We were able to do it for all the sites in the valley um, based on this um, computer data. Uh, if people want to hear more about the specifics of how we figured this out, I can put you to sleep afterwards, but uh, just trust me. Uh, I can give you the article if you really want to read uh, the, the details. Uh, when we crunched all the data and everything came back, we figured out, much to our surprise, that there were about 6,500 people living in the valley at that time, which was particularly interesting because you remember there was that one Franciscan who gave us a, a very uh, specific count of the people in the valley in the 1620s, which was uh, 6,500 and I can't remember now, 22. It was, a, it was an exact number, right? And our estimates came out very close to it. And I promise you, I did not reverse engineer <laughs> the data. I actually gave it to two graduate students without telling them what the Franciscans' estimates were. And I said, you guys crunch these numbers uh, based on the LIDAR data and tell me what you think the population estimate is. And this is what they came back to. So now we know that before, on the eve of European contact, so before they have any direct contacts, or even if we go all the way back to 1492, we can say there's about 6,500 people living in the valley at that time. And we know that by 1680, which is this period called the Pueblo Revolt, that that goes all the way down to 900 people. And so that is a population loss of 87 percent. When you talk about the population, are you including all the Indians? This is just Native American. What? Yeah. This is just the Native American population, just the indigenous but, but, population. But the, uh, the Indian population is probably 
probably very large. This is the Indian population. That's what I'm talking about. Are you familiar with the book by, uh, I think it's, uh, his first name is Pecker. Uh, Pecker Hemelainen, yes. Yeah, the, the Comanche, Comanche Empire. Empire. For everyone else. Yeah. Now, in, in reading that book, you get the impression that there were many, many more people, uh, according to him, than, than I'm hearing. Sure. So Pekka Hemelainen is talking about the Comanche. That's a different tribe than I'm talking about. Yeah. So I'm only talking about the one valley that I do research in. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And the Comanche are 19th century, so they're a couple hundred years after this. But, but how, how if, do you, I don't know, uh, or remember, or, I, or even know if he gave an, uh, an exact figure or guess as to the population, but, and how far back So the Comanche are a different tribe. So there are today 567 federally recognized tribes. There are hundreds of, of tribes. Right. Right. Even more than, than there are today. Right. Yeah. And so I'm talking about one tribe, and I'm talking about the evidence I have for that tribe. I do think that 87%, you could probably, it probably, there are similar losses here in the Northeast, in Florida, and other places. The Comanche is a different story because you actually see a population increase after the horse is introduced. And the horse is introduced because of European contact, right? So there isn't a horse here afterwards. But we're talking now uh, 300 years after the period that I'm talking about here and, and to the east. So different tribe, OK? So. Well, I'll, I'll come to this later, but there's a, there's a rebound that happens. But different tribe, OK? Um, but here's the audience participation part, right? So I'm going to demonstrate to you what an 87% population loss would be. So I, I have to ask everybody to stand up. It's only for a minute, I promise. You don't have to dance. You don't have to sing. You just have to stand, OK? OK, now, if your birthday falls between January 1 and February 16, I want you to remain standing. If your birthday falls between February 17 and December 31st, you should sit. So in this room, that's an 87% population loss, right? So you can see how drastic. So think about what this would mean in your society if you lost 87% of your population in terms of, you know, and these are, these are societies that uh, exist, you know, it's an oral society only. So in terms of um, the, the kinds of ritual knowledge, the historical knowledge, all the things that would be lost in 87% uh, population loss would be massive. The really incredible thing is that these people are still around today and still have these traditions intact and shows you some of the efforts uh, that went in. in. In Hamas, they consolidated from 18 villages down into one village, and this is one of the ways they were able uh, to maintain themselves. But um, I don't want to overstate, I don't think I can overstate, the magnitude of the population loss. And this was in a 50-year um, period, roughly. So 87% of the population in 50 years. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I should have looked up what the population of Wayland is before and, and run similar numbers. But anyway, uh, it's a dire population loss during this period. Um, now, um, so from our study, we were able to figure out that it was this 87% population loss. What we still didn't know, oh, sorry, I'm probably getting out of the camera. Um, what we still didn't know was the timing of that decline, right? Does that happen very early? Um, you know, something more in line with Dobbins' <laughs> hypothesis. Does it happen late? Um, so for that, we went to the tree ring data. I, I mentioned this word before, dendrochronology, where we use tree rings, uh, where we can get the actual years uh, that a tree is growing. Um, and in the Southwest, we have a record of tree rings that goes back thousands of years. Um, so what we did on this project was we actually went out to the sites. I told you before how uh, they had cut down all the trees 
uh, on the landscape. So we went and we uh, tried to establish when the trees that are there on the landscape today started growing. And the trees in New Mexico, uh, you can have trees that grow for 500 or more years. And so we actually were interested in looking at the earliest date to see when the trees were germinating uh, on the landscape. We also are able to tell the history of fire through a, a, an interesting wrinkle. Um, again, I can talk about that in the Q&A if people want to hear what happens with fire during this time. Um, so these are, these are each uh, a, a LIDAR map of, of villages. So each one of these is a village. You see all these, uh, these, these are the room blocks that I was talking about. Um, and each triangle is a tree that we put a core into to measure the number of tree rings in there. And what we found at all the sites that we measured was we did not see any trees growing on the site at all during the 1500s. And we didn't see them during the, uh, at the time of uh, European contact, we didn't see them for the first decade of the 1600s. We didn't see them for the second decade of the 1600s. It's really in the 1630s that we see regrowth happening at these sites. And that's telling us that the people have moved off of these sites and the forest is starting to regrow. And so that let us know that the depopulation takes place just before that in the 1620s. And so this was unexpected for us because I said before, earliest contact with Europeans happens 80 years before this. And Cortez is down in Mexico 100 years before this. So a lot of the theories um, before would have speculated that we should have seen population loss earlier. And so we're seeing population loss very late. So the question was, what happens in the 1620s to promote population loss? Well, one of the uh, potential issues is we see an expansion of the Franciscan missionary program in the 1620s. So it, uh, we see more priests on the ground out there. But in this valley, there's only one priest. This is actually the mission church that he built in 1623. still stands there um, today. Um, but uh, a lone priest is not a very good vector for disease unless he enters the valley with an active case of smallpox, which is highly unlikely. Um, and uh, we can see in the record of the, the bones that they, they don't yet have European livestock coming in. So it doesn't seem that livestock were the vectors um, for disease either. Um, uh, but what we think now happens is that the timing of the depopulation um, is not necessarily because of uh, uh, missionary activities, but because of the larger picture of colonialism, which introduced resource stress, malnutrition, and starvation, and made the Pueblos more susceptible to disease, right? So they, they're taxed very, very heavily um, by the Spaniards when they come in. Uh, the Spaniards themselves say that when they arrive on the scene, they're wholly dependent on the Pueblos for their food. But within three years, the Spaniards have collected all the Pueblo stores of food, and now they're, they're the ones the Pueblos are coming to. So they've managed to the fancy term we use is they've inverted the subsistence economy. They've made the indigenous people dependent on them for food rather than um, the, other ways, uh, the other way around. Um, so um, when disease does sweep through, we can ask ourselves, how did the Pueblos think about this? Well, uh, at Hamas, the tribe that I work with, um, uh, they tell a story. Uh, they, they blame a malevolent spirit that they call the Kliwa which would translate something like refuse wind, the garbage wind. Um, and they said that when, when the, the Kliwa sweep through, that's what brings disease. So they actually didn't attribute this directly to the Europeans. Uh, they had a separation between the Europeans and what they saw as malevolent spirits that were uh, visiting on them with disease. And I would argue that in kind of the same way that the Pueblo separated Europeans from the spread of disease, um, some of the more popular works of the last 25 years uh, uh, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel being primary example among them, uh, have also popularized notions that Native American depopulation was separated, um, was a natural event, um, and it was due to the particularities of geography and genes that the Europeans introduced it, but it wasn't the Europeans' fault so much through uh, colonialism, but it was uh, because of uh, inherent susceptibility. Um, but this really serves to shift blame off of settler colonialism and onto microbes and genes. Um, and after doing this research and seeing the timing of 
no longer ascribe to the notion that it was just an oops, uh, a way of a disease spreads through, but there's much more complex processes that are going on here, making Native people um, uh, vulnerable uh, to disease. Um, so the timing of the depopulation suggests that Native Americans were not born vulnerable, they were made vulnerable by malnutrition, by poverty, by warfare, and by dislocation. Um, this is from uh, an Aztec codex, uh, a folding uh, uh, book that they illustrated that's showing um, uh, smallpox sweeping through uh, uh, in the, the 1620s. Um, now, I'm not arguing here that the introduction of disease was unavoidable. Um, I, I think uh, introduction of disease was, um, was not avoidable. But the consequences, that 87%, were not inevitable. Um, history shows us that other populations suffered devastating declines due to epidemics, but their populations were all able to recover. So there's a massive uh, epidemic in Athens in 430 BC. Um, Rome has smallpox in the second and third centuries, um, and of course the bubonic plague in medieval Europe. Um, all these populations were able to recover in a way that Native Americans were not able to accomplish really until the last 50 years, the second half of the 20th century is where we start to see native populations coming back maybe to the areas that they were um, in the uh, 15th century. So the question maybe we should be asking ourselves um, is not how many Native Americans died, but why weren't their populations able to recover? And for indigenous people living uh, in colonialism, health disparities have persisted um, whether we're talking about smallpox and measles and typhus in the 17th and 18th centuries, tuberculosis in the 19th and 20th centuries, or diabetes in the 21st century, Native Americans have suffered disparate health outcomes wherever they have been in colonial regimes. So today, indigenous communities suffer deaths due to diabetes more than three times the rate of other Americans, cardiovascular disease twice the rate of the rest of the nation, and infant mortality rates double that the rest of the US population. And I, I, once when I was giving it, this talk, a doctor in the audience said, well, yeah, 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 but infectious disease is way different than those. So I added some infectious disease as stats uh, to counter that. In the 1918 um, Spanish flu pandemic, and again in 2009 during the outbreak of swine flu, uh, H1N1, the death rate for indigenous groups who contacted these diseases was four times that of other racial and ethnic groups uh, in the Americas. And then you know, probably unsurprisingly, um, indigenous communities were hit particularly hard more recently by the coronavirus pandemic. So in New Mexico, uh, Native Americans comprise 11% of the state's population, but they accounted for 57% of the state's COVID-19 cases in the early months of the pandemic. And they had community infection rates higher than uh, New York City at the height of the 2020 uh, pandemic. Um, so. Uh, my argument here is that, um, uh, you know, often when we talk about early colonialism in the Americas, it can seem like this was a one-time occurrence uh, that was uh, a kind of an accident of history and evolution. But what I'm arguing here is we have made choices along the way about how we're distributing our uh, health resources, and it continues down to the present day that Native peoples are suffering uh, disparate uh, health outcomes. Um, so now I'm going to try to return back to the site that I started from, 1021, with Landsaw Meadows. And the reason that I started with this is because here we saw colonization by European peoples. We know that they had interactions, limited interactions, but interactions nonetheless with uh, the local indigenous population. But we did not see waves of epidemic disease sweeping out from Newfoundland. Right? Uh, we don't see population losses in Newfoundland or in Greenland, uh, incidentally, which we don't think of as part of uh, North America. But in fact, the, the population uh, biologically is uh, indigenous uh, peoples who, who moved across the, the Arctic. Um, and there's coexistence there for 500 years without the same kind of drastic uh, population loss for indigenous peoples. So, uh, I think uh, this example, this is a map of uh, Lansaw Meadows, so you can see the different Viking houses that they had here, and each one of these red dots is a different artifact that they found. Um, 
But uh, my argument is that this is a counterexample that shows us that everything that's happened since 1492 wasn't inevitable. Uh, and this is a result of specific choices that people are making and uh, uh, some larger uh, uh, processes that are unique to post-1492 European uh, colonialism. Um, and I, I think we should think about that as we move forward and think about things like how we distribute our health resources uh, in the US today. So I don't know how close I am to 45, but um, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. And thank you all for coming. And uh, if people have questions, I'm happy to take it. We can turn the light up if, if you want to. Then I can see people a little better. Thank you. Sure. Oh, on your area where they built their citizen story hut. Um, yeah. Were those all extended family members there? Oh, that's a great, a, a great question. Um, so um, they would have had a, probably a two or three room suite for each family. They were very likely multi generational families. One thing that we know is that after the Spaniards come in, the rooms get a lot bigger. And the reason we think that's happening is one of the, the priests says, when the Spaniards start taxing, they, they go door to door uh, and <laughs> rather than household by household. So the Pueblos get smart fast, and they figure, all right, we're going to move everybody into a bigger room with just uh, one door. So I always say people have been cheating on their taxes since the 17th century. Um, uh, but uh, extended family units and multi-generational Housing is actually still the rule at Hamas. My friends that live at Hamas today often, you know, it's often grandparents, their uh, children. Uh, uh, they are, um, well, on marriage, it, there's no straight rule at Hamas on whether the husband moves into the wife's house or the wife moves into the, some, some societies have strict rules around that. But anyway, um, in, in my friend's house in Wilma, they actually have four generations uh, living there now down to the uh, great grandchildren uh, of the of the people who own the house but in the design of the building from your document aerial point of view did those designs uh, have special meanings to oh them? yeah um, sometimes they did uh, often what we're looking at here is uh, a, a, an accretion that sometimes formed over decades or even centuries where different wings were um, added on so it really depends on when in the site sequence um, and uh, how it's being added on. Sometimes we can see a whole village working together to build it at once. That seems like very directed and has a very intentional design. And then the longer they live there, the more houses get added on and it starts to obfuscate that design. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, please. OK. So I'm not quite saying that. I do think there are some factors that would have predisposed them to be more susceptible, but not a difference of 87% versus, say, like, uh, you know, when we have um, smallpox in other places, they might have a 6% mortality rate. Um, so what I'm saying is I think there probably is a slightly higher rate, but that it gets exacerbated. Um, Oh, Native Americans come from originally? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually, I have to write this all up as a book. And so it, it's hard to fit it all into 45 minutes. No, 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 it's a great question. Um, we really have to go all the way back to the original people in the Americas, which we now think took place probably about 20,000 years ago. Um, and, you know, uh, it, 
if I give my Anthropology 101 lecture, all of humankind starts in Africa. So all uh, genetic diversity starts in Africa and people migrate out. And so the farther we get from Africa, the less genetic diversity um, we get. And so by the time you get into South American populations, it's true that they have um, very similar um, uh, immune profiles. Uh, that are far less diverse than parts of Africa. So, for example, there are certain diseases, um, well, basically 33% uh, uh, of indigenous South American populations will have the same, uh, 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 I'm not using the correct term, but immune profile. So they will be more susceptible um, to disease. Um, uh, but, uh, so we can see things, weird things happen like, um, when Cortez attacks Tenochtitlan, uh, he actually loses the first time, but then when he comes back the second time, uh, smallpox sweeps through. And that's, that's probably what uh, allows the Spaniards uh, to win. The Spaniards have a huge group of native allies with them, more native allies fighting for them than the Spaniards themselves, the Tlaxcalans, who are enemies of the, the Aztecs. The Tlaxcalans do not they're not affected by smallpox in the same ways that the Aztecs were. Now, I think that's probably because the Spaniards know something about how you nurse people with, it's a, it's a disease that they are familiar with, um, and so they have more effective strategies to cope with it. Also, however, the Aztecs are, now this was a place that had millions of people, was a dense urban environment, and was a highly stratified society. So one thing that I think I see in the record is that societies with an existing underclass, people who are already living in poverty, are particularly hard hit when disease rolls in, right? Um, but basically my argument is just it's a lot more complicated than just, oh, they didn't have, their immune systems weren't as good, and oops, poof, uh, you know, disease sweeps through. That there's a lot more um, going on than that. So, no, thank you. It's a great question. Mr. Tuft. Yeah. So we have records of that happening later uh, with uh, smallpox infested blankets um, being given to Plains tribes. Um, the time period I'm talking about here, um, 16th, 17th century, they didn't have a germ theory yet. Uh, they didn't understand how disease is spreading. And so I don't have any clear evidence that that was going on. And in fact, uh, the archaeology would suggest that the Spaniards did not want this to happen. So they are building these mission sites that are absolutely massive uh, that they're intending to have filled with native neophytes that are going to come and live there way, way bigger, and it never happens because, uh, you know, the, the populations plummet immediately after this. They're also, this is the labor class for the Spaniards, so they're invested. They want uh, people to, to be around in this, in this area. Later on, when we start to get <coughs> into the Indian Wars period and on the plains, uh, there is uh, uh, definite directed evidence to um, wipe people out and to use uh, disease as, as part of that. Uh, part of that process. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to whether there was any contributory role of uh, climate or flash powder uh, in this process? Uh, climate and fire, yes. Um, you know, the state of Rome. Yeah. The state of Rome, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. There's a so um, we actually have a fire component about this, so we can see the, the changes in the fire regimes that results by moving people off of uh, the landscape. There's no major climatic uh, you know, uh, hinge point here that would have um, pushed it over. The, um, when you hear people talk about the Little Ice Age, uh, it just didn't have a big effect in the American West in the same way that it did even here um, on the East Coast. However, when people migrate into the Americas, they come through a pretty cold area down into this one. And people have talked about the effect over thousands of years that that could have had uh, in, um, uh, you know, basically weeding out some 
disease that could have um, come in. And I've also wondered about Lansaw Meadows and Greenland, where it's much colder. Now, they have much more limited contact with the indigenous people. They don't like the indigenous people. They call them scralings. Um, uh, there's not a ton of trade, but there's definitely some and some warfare that goes on um, between those groups. Um, but they're not um, in a mercantile capitalist system, so they're not, they're not trying to extract the same resources in the same way. It's just a very different kind of uh, colonialism. Um, but uh, I, have, I do think that this plays a factor because we see particularly hard-hit areas like the Caribbean, Central Mexico, the Southeast U.S. is really devastated uh, uh, shortly after early contacts with uh, Europeans, um, partially because pigs are flourishing when they get introduced down there, and they're a vector um, for disease. But So I do think that climate plays a role. And maybe one thing that's going on in New Mexico is there's essentially a buffer zone because we have northwest Mexico, which is a desert area. Populations are very sparse there, um, and so that is they, they had a, a wagon train that would bring up supplies for the Franciscans and the, the Spaniards who are stationed in New Mexico that would come every three years. So it's just a, there's not as much, it's not as densely populated. Um, and I think that could be um, playing a role in, in the spread of these infectious diseases as well. Yeah. Um, From the Zoom community. Um, so there is some evidence in DNA studies of population bottlenecks, um, particularly out of South America, that appear to um, coincide with the introduction of old world um, diseases. We don't have a particularly robust data set from North America because most tribes are um, reticent to have their uh, DNA uh, studied uh, for long and complex and understandable uh, reasons. Um, so there is some suggestive evidence of that, but we don't have uh, a robust enough data set yet to really um, be able to say. People have tried to look uh, in, uh, so, so many of the diseases we're talking about here don't leave a signature on the skeleton, right? So they affect the soft tissues. So you don't see smallpox. If someone dies of smallpox and you find their skeleton, there's, there's no indicator on the skeleton. Tuberculosis will, will um, leave some telltale signs, but most of the diseases we're talking about that are infectious diseases, um, strike the soft tissue and it, it, you, you die too fast. It doesn't leave a signature um, on, your, on your bones. But uh, people have tried to um, see if there were, <coughs> were um, remnants of um, diseases and, and have found forms of cholera in some places in central Mexico um, that could be uh, one of the diseases. You know, there's, it's not just one disease here. There's lots of different diseases that are coming in and, and circulating. and. Uh, moving around as well. Please. I, I thought there were more uh, trade groups that were involved in this area. Yeah. Um, as you said, we are not uh, monetary tribal mm -hmm. by settlement. Uh, what is your position or perception on why we see that many Oh, that's spoken like a true Massachusetts <laughs> resident, because they would say they live in a beautiful um, place. So although it's dry in a high desert climate, uh, it was, there was better moisture. And especially back in this time period, it was a pretty good place to live if you're a, a corn farmer. Um, so it was a good place for corn agriculture. And in fact, in this valley, the reason they're choosing these mesas is because they slope slightly to the southwest. So they have a great aspect for uh, getting the sun, solar radiation. The sun is intense in um, New Mexico. So it's actually a good place for growing corn, highly productive corn yield. Their populations were way, way lower than we're seeing today, right? So they didn't have to support millions of people, but it's good to support, you know, on, on the, the kinds of levels that, that we're talking about. Um, uh, so if you ask them why they end up there, um, they have long histories of migration kind of throughout the Four Corners um, region. 
Um, and uh, here they're living along the Rio Grande and its tributaries. So there are permanent water sources around um, and, and really good hunting in this area too. So they're, they're not just farmers, they're also uh, hunting. We find a lot of evidence for uh, uh, hunting in the archeological <coughs> record as well. So as far as food sources go, they're not, it's not a desert like Wile E. Coyote kind of, uh, that kind of desert. Uh, it's a high desert climate, but there is uh, um, uh, perennial sources of water uh, they can get, and, and it's actually a pretty good place to, to grow crops, so. Why did I? <laughs> uh, a lot of serendipity. Um, uh, after college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and I went to work in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, and then I went to graduate school, and my advisor worked with the Pueblo uh, over the mountains, and, and he said, uh, you should go to New Mexico. And then I went there, and it was beautiful, and the people were great, and the food's great, and it was hard to... <laughs> Hard to, to leave there. Um, why I was interested in this period? Well, most archaeologists are interested in way, way older stuff. So as I said, I do current events. So I think part of it was I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. Um, and, and the preservation's even better for this time period. So I work at some villages where it looks like they just left you know, last week. The walls are still standing this high. You can see all the all the rooms, um, and in the southwest there's pottery. There's just the, arch the archaeology. The southwest is kind of the, the, I'm biased, but the best place in the U.S. to do uh, archaeology. So um, it's a lot harder around here to do archaeology than than out there. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And we see that in the tree ring record. So, yeah. So, all, yes to all the above. So, we know there's warfare both, you know, between the, the Spaniards and indigenous peoples, but also uh, among indigenous groups. And we can see splintering at certain times and factionalism and groups splitting off and going other places. In the Southwest, we're actually pretty good at being able to trace where they go. So, in, in the valley, when it goes from 6,500 people down to 900. One of our early questions was, are those people just going off to live other places? Because we know later in time that they do that. We, we, we have that. Uh, all these tribes make pretty distinctive kinds of pottery. Um, so I'm lucky to work in an area where you can actually see uh, they make this very distinctive pottery. And so when they go out somewhere else, we usually see the pottery ending up at those sites. And we don't see that kind of migration. We also see these similar population declines happening in other areas of the Southwest at the same time. So what we would expect to see would be an increase in population somewhere. If we were seeing people move out, we don't see that in this early period. But certainly, um, you know, it, it, all these are, this is, the, the depopulation is overdetermined. There are multiple factors that are coming into play, and sometimes they're exacerbating one another. So. When the Spaniards are collecting their food stores, the Pueblos were pretty good. They had lived out here for you know, a couple thousand years. They knew how to handle drought, because drought happens often in the Southwest. And so they, the, the practice was to have seven years of stored corn. They can store and dry corn. And the Spaniards start collecting that as soon as they get there. And that's, what <laughs> that's why the Pueblos become dependent on them. So now if that happens, and then you go into drought, and your crop fails. Now you get a starvation situation that then also makes your population more vulnerable to disease because you're just not as healthy. So when diseases strike, well, my daughter has to go to bed, so she's waving <laughs> goodbye to me back there. Thank you for coming, guys. Um, uh, but uh, I think all of this is true. And <laughs> by the way, like, yeah, there's when people are under stress, now you have people raiding each other. So we see this happen with the Navajo and the Pueblos. So prior to European contact, the Navajo and the Pueblos seem to be, have a pretty robust trade network. The Navajos are moving around. They're bringing in things like um, bison and, and other uh, resources that the Pueblos would have wanted. The Pueblos are trading out corn to them. 
when the Spaniards come in, they disrupt that trade because now the Pueblos don't have anything to trade. But the Navajos were dependent on that food source. So they start raiding the villages because they need the food. Then the Spaniards are like, all right, they're going to raid us. We're going back and attacking them. And it starts this cycle of violence that we can see ticking up throughout the 17th century. So uh, everything you mentioned is definitely part of it. Um, and, uh, and there definitely is uh, internal factionalism and divisions within indigenous communities that are playing out at this time as well. Uh, arrowheads, some of that. So um, I do some work on on lithics. Um, uh, uh, yes, on, on obsidian uh, to see people uh, moving around and stuff. But that's another talk. I got that, That's a whole other other thing. Um, it, we didn't use much lithic data, any lithic data in for for this question, but I have uh, in other time periods for other other things. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm not a medical expert, but it still is a massive disease, uh, diabetes uh, for native populations, um, because uh, uh, refined sugars were not a part of their diet. Um, uh, uh, and they didn't evolve with um, refined sugars, and so they're being introduced. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I, <laughs> we need a doctor to answer these questions more accurately, but still continues to be, uh, you know, probably the largest um, uh, health crisis uh, for a lot of indigenous communities today. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody.